So next we move on to the cranial nerve history. So what happens in cranial nerves is, uh, what we commonly do is, we tend to mix up history and examination which is very common in the cranial nerves. In other complaints as uh, at least we will be able to differentiate between history and examination. But what happens is when you start with the history taking of the uh, cranial nerves, you will end up doing the examination immediately, which should not happen. We should be very thoughtful about this and we should, when we are taking a history, we should do only the history. Okay? So that will help you in actually properly coming to a conclusion. What will happen otherwise is, you will get mixed up with the examination and the, um, and the history taking and there will be very biased output. So what we should do is, first we should take a good history and then move on to the cranial nerve examination. So, for starting with the cranial nerves, the first one is the olfactory nerve. Olfactory nerve is, uh, as we all know, it has something to do with the smell. Okay. So, the patient might be able to tell you that, I feel that there is a bad smell always. I am not able to feel any smell. Okay. And uh, my, my, uh, you know, my friend says that it is very fragrant, but I am not able to smell even the flowers. So, this is a very, com this, this is a very common complaint that you see. We need to keep in mind that this common complaint can be seen even in patients with sinusitis, allergic rhinitis or a hay fever, something like that. Even a common cold can cause loss of smell sensation. In the present situation, we also need to keep in mind about the COVID scenario. Okay, coming out of that, so CNS lesions can also produce something like a meningioma, you know, front, uh, subfrontal meningioma or a frontal lobe tumor. All these things can produce um, olfactory nerve involvement. So we need to be keeping in mind that it can either be a complete loss of smell, it can be you know decreased smell sensation or in some patients it might be an exaggerated smell sensation or in some patients even fragrant things that can be interpreted as very you know dirty smells by the patient. That is also a very uh, stressful situation for the patient. So we need to uh, assess the olfactory nerve history. Okay. The other thing which is very important is olfactory hallucinations. As I told you, uh, prior to a seizure episode, the patient can have olfactory hallucinations. These olfactory hallucinations are more commonly seen in patients with temporal lobe epilepsy. Temporal lobe epilepsy. So we need to ask the patient if he had, if he has had any, uh, any complaints of hallucinations. Most commonly, olfactory hallucinations. Okay. So next, moving on to the second nerve, which is ophthalmic nerve. Ophthalmic nerve has everything to do with the vision. Okay. So, in this we have to be very careful because when we tend to ask the patient, we move on to the history. Uh, we move on to the examination without asking the history. So, we should very clearly find a demarcation between the history taking and the examination. So, for the ophthalmic nerve history, what we will do is we should ask the patient if he can see both nearby objects and far away objects clearly without any difficulty. This is very very important and we should also see we should also ask the patient if he is able to see all the colors clearly. The patient might sometimes say that, my wife says that this is a red sari, but I am not, a, but I'm not able to appreciate the red color. So this is very commonly seen. Uh, though it is a rare condition, the patient will have, you know, the patient will be able to identify it first and they will be able to tell, uh, able to tell you if there is any desaturation in the colors. The patient is not able to see a particular color, he will be able to come out with that complaint. Okay. And the next important thing is visual fields. We should see if the patient is able to see in all the fields. Okay. Uh, say commonly if there is a pituitary lesion, lesion in the pituitary, uh, pituitary gland, that time it will be pressing on the chiasma, optic chiasma. So the patient will have bitemporal hemianopia. What is bitemporal? The visual field will be lost in both the temporal fields, in both the right and the left eye. So that is bitemporal hemianopia. So the patient will be able to see, say, say that uh, after this point I am not able to see anything on the other side, on the opposite side. So that is a uh, characteristic of a visual field loss. Okay, the patient will be able to tell. Sometimes the patient will also say that there is a curtain-like sensation. There is a black curtain that is falling under my eyes. So that sensation should also be given due importance. So uh, all these things will help in identifying if there is an ophthalmic nerve involvement. The other important thing is we should ask if there is any black spot in the visual field. Usually macular lesions will cause uh, macular lesions will cause a black spot in the visual field. So we need to ask the patients if his vision is okay, you know his uh, acuity. For the acuity we ask if the patient is able to see nearby objects and far away objects. If the patient is able to see color properly, all the colors, the visual fields if they are okay and if there is any black spot in the image. Okay. So next we will be discussing about the third, fourth and sixth cranial nerves. 
So all these three cranial nerves are, uh, you know, go hand in hand with the extraocular movements. Extraocular movements. So this is the ocular motor nerve, trochlear nerve, and the abducens nerves. So patients with extraocular muscle involvement, uh, muscle uh, lesion involvement. So these patients will complain of double vision. So double vision is the patient will say, "I am seeing everything as double." So when when the patient says this complaint, we should immediately ask if it increases on seeing any particular side. So the patient might sometimes say that if I see uh, on my right side the uh, double vision increases, if I see on my left side the double vision increases. Uh, the patient might sometimes say if I close one eye, the double vision just disappears and I'm able to see very clearly. So this is all an indication of which side of the um, you know which side of the nerve is involved. So we need to find out the double vision when it happens. We should ask if it is present uh, present on uh, you know increases on seeing on some particular side. Or if it decreases on closing one particular eye, okay. And sometimes there might be some associated pain with the double vision. So as we all know, in patients with cavernous sinus thrombosis, the patient will have an extraocular muscle involvement. That is the third, fourth, or the sixth cranial nerves will be involved, and the patient will have very painful ocular movement. This will give a clue, and there will also be associated redness of the eyes. These associated complaints are very important, so that we should know. Uh, we should ask the patient if he has any pain associated with it, or if he is having redness associated with the complaint of the extraocular muscle involvement. So the patient will have double vision. He can have some associated pain, and he can also have redness of the eyes. Okay. And the other thing is, we should ask the ask the patient if he has any difficulty in opening the eyes, and if there is any change with activity. So difficulty in opening the eyes is because basically the patient will have a ptosis, that is the drooping of the eyelid. Drooping of the eyelid is not only commonly seen in these three, four, six lesions. We will also see in patients with myasthenia gravis. Myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disorder, uh, which will be affecting the neuromuscular junction. In lesions affecting the neuromuscular junction, we will see that the patient will have a drooping of eyelids. So the drooping of eyelids will be less during the day, during the mornings, and as the patient does some activity or as the day progresses towards the evening or the night, the ptosis will keep on increasing. Which is, you know, very characteristic of, which is called fatigability, and this is a very characteristic symptom of another CNS CNS disorder, which is myasthenia gravis. So we need to differentiate if it is a purely, uh, you know, neuromuscular junction involvement or if it is a cranial nerve involvement. Like I told you, a particular complaint can have multiple systems involved, but we need to differentiate if it is a neuromuscular junction involvement or if it is a uh, cranial nerve involvement. For that, we need to ask all these negative history. So, like we know, negative history is as much important as we take a good positive history. Negative history is very, very important. So, we need to ask if the patient has any difficulty in opening the eyes, or if there is any change. In, if that is there, then we have to ask if there is a change in activity of the uh, in due course of the activity. If there is any change in the weakness, okay. And then we have to ask about the features of Horner's syndrome. When we ask about the uh, when we are asking the history of the patient for Horner's syndrome. We can ask only two complaints. We can ask for ptosis, or we can ask for loss of uh, loss of sweating sensation over the face, one half of the face. These are the two complaints that we can ask. But whereas in examination, when we examine the patient, we'll be able to assess the ciliospinal reflex. We'll be able to look for the myotic pupils. We'll be able to look for the uh, ptosis. We'll be able to look for the uh, loss of sweating on one side. So all these things can be done during examination. But when you ask the patient for history. The patient will be only able to tell you whether there is drooping of the eyelids or if there is a loss of sweating. These are the two complaints in regard to Horner syndrome, which the patient will be able to tell you. So patients with three, four, six cranial nerve lesions, they can have an associated Horner syndrome also. Okay, so the next cranial nerve will be the trigeminal nerve. As soon as we say the trigeminal nerve, we should think about the face. Trigeminal nerve has three components, which is basically the ophthalmic component, maxillary component, and the mandibular component. And as we all know, it is a sensory and a motor component. It has both the sensory and the motor component also. So the sensory will be the sensations over the face. So we have to see whether one half of the face is affected by the sensations. Okay. So the if there can be either a decreased or an abnormal sensations over the face. Uh, commonly, what we see is patients with herpes lesions, herpes zoster. It can affect either the ophthalmic branch or the maxillary branch or the of the uh, mandibular branch. In these lesions associated, they will also have some kind of pain, and they will have some skin lesions, and they will have a cranial nerve. The loss of sensation will be there. 
So we have to see if there is any visible, uh, we have to ask the patient if he developed any kind of uh, skin lesions over the face. Okay. And there will also be a difficulty in chewing or mastication. This is very important when we ask for the history of mandibular nerve involvement. When the mandibular component of the trigeminal nerve is involved, the patient will have difficulty in chewing the food. He will be having difficulty in masticating the food. So this is also a very important part. So we should ask about both his sensory component as well as the motor component for the trigeminal nerve. Okay. Next is a very important facial nerve. Our examiners are very fond of this nerve and they keep asking questions only about facial nerve more commonly. So when a patient is having a facial nerve involvement, what will he commonly say to you? Come, come and complain to you. He will say that I feel that my facial symmetry is lost. I feel that one side of my face is different from the other side. This is because the uh, facial, you know, as we know the facial nerve has two components that is the sensory and the motor and it also has some special functions like the lacrimation and salivation components also the secretory functions are also present. So when we ask for the history of the, pa history of the patient, we should ask for the sensation uh, even uh, even the sensation as well as the motor component and also about these special functions. Okay, so for the motor component, we know that the fa facial nerve supplies the uh, face muscles of facial expression. So we should see if the we should ask the patient if he is able to smile comfortably, if he has any difficulty in closing the eyes. Okay, in third cranial nerve, uh, third, three, four, six cranial nerve involvement, we will find that the patient has ptosis and he has difficulty in opening the eyelids. Eyelids. But in the facial nerve, what we will see is the patient has difficulty in closing the eyes, especially in a lower motor neuron involvement of the facial nerve. We will see that the patient's, uh, patient's eyes are wide open and because of that, the patient might develop keratitis and other ophthalmic complications because the patient's like, the eyes are exposed and the patient will develop dryness. So uh, when, we ask, when we ask the patient for history of eye uh, difficulty in closing the eyes, we should be very mindful of the other complications that can develop also. So when we talk about facial asymmetry again, the patient will say that my mouth is deviated to one side. What we commonly see is the facial deviation will be the deviation of mouth, mouth deviation will be opposite to the side of lesion, opposite to the side of lesion. Okay. So why is this so? Because when there is a facial involvement, say on the left side, the muscles of the face on the right side are very normal. So when, this, when, the, when these side uh, muscles are normal, these muscles will tend to pull the mouth towards the normal side to maintain the neutral position. So in that case, the, we see that the facial deviation or the deviation of angle of mouth is to the opposite side of the lesion. So if the patient has a left facial nerve involvement, the deviation of angle of mouth will be towards the right. Okay, And there will be drooling of saliva on that side. And there will be difficulty in smiling and difficulty in uh, you know, raising the eyebrows and difficulty in uh, making a, a puffed cheek or difficulty in blowing out, all these complaints will be seen if the patient this, the patient might say I am not able to blow a balloon. Okay, All these are because of involvement of the facial nerve. Along with this, we should also ask if the patient has any difficulty in uh, perceiving the taste of the food. When we ask this, we will get an idea whether the sensory component of the uh, sensory component which is usually the cauda tympani nerve, if it is affected or not. So that we have to assess. So it is very important that we assess the motor component, the sensory component as well as the secretory component which the patient will be able to tell you that he is not able to uh, you know, tear, get tears. These will be the common complaints when the patient presents with a facial nerve injury. Okay, next we move on to the vestibular cochlear nerve. Okay, vestibular cochlear nerve has two components. One is the vestibular component and the next is cochlear component. Vestibular component is all about balance. So it maintains the balance of the body. Cochlear component is about hearing. Okay. So patients presenting with uh, vestibular, co vestibular cochlear nerve involvement can have any of the symptoms, any of this one uh, balance or hearing complaints or they may have both the complaints. So if uh, the patient can present with hearing impairment, he may say that off late I am having difficulty in hearing. Off late I feel that my uh, hearing is reduced in the left ear or it is reduced in the right ear. So this you know this vestibular cochlear nerve this can also be affected like I would say for an example if there is a CP angle tumor. CP angle tumor like we all know the facial nerve can be affected or the vestibular cochlear nerve can be affected especially in uh, you know um, schwannoma or uh, tumors like that we can see the vestibular cochlear nerve being involved 
at that point of time the patient can have either the vestibular component being involved or the cochlear component can be involved. So we need to ask about first the hearing and next complaints of giddiness if there is any room spinning sensation. The patient can also complain that he is having uh, a ringing sensation in his ears which is nothing but the tinnitus. Okay? So this complaint of tinnitus is also very commonly seen when the patient has a vestibular cochlear nerve involvement. Apart from all these things what we should keep in mind is local, uh, local problems of the ear like an otitis media can cause defects in hearing. We commonly see that patients with chronic, or, uh, chronic separative otitis media they will have difficulty in hearing. But we should not confuse this hearing loss with that of a neurological problem. So we need to keep in mind that in all the complaints even in all cranial nerves especially local problems should also be kept in mind to assess whether it is a neurological complaint or it is a local disorder that is occurring. So the patient might uh, not remember that his that he had a separate otitis media earlier but he might tell you that he had a surgery he had some mastoidectomy done for this for that procedure for that complaint. So he might not remember the complaint but he will be able to tell you that he underwent a procedure. So that history should also be elicited when you talk about the history or history digging of vestibular cochlear nerve uh, history. Okay. Next is the ninth and 10th nerves which is the glossopharyngeal and the vagus nerves. So these two nerves go always hand in hand. Like we saw that the, uh, the 3, 4, 6 cranial nerves go hand in hand. The glossopharyngeal and the vagus nerves go hand in hand always. So and we will not be able to differentiate between the two. Uh, in 3, 4, 6 nerves sometimes we will, be, we will be able to identify you know isolated lesions of the 6th nerve, isolated lesions of the 3rd nerve. Whereas in 9th and 10th nerve we will not be able to always say whether it is a 9th, uh, 9th nerve lesion or a 10th nerve lesion. Uh, as usual this 9th uh, and 10th nerves they have both uh, sensory component and the motor component. So and it has 3 characteristic features which is dysphagia, dysphonia and dysarthria. So difficulty in swallowing, hoarseness of voice or the patient can have a nasal twang uh, or there is a difficulty in voice articulation. Okay, so difficulty in swallowing, difficulty in uh, that is dysphagia, then dysphonia or a difficulty in articulating the voice which is dysarthria. Okay, apart from all these things the patient may have a nasal twang or he may have nasal regurgitation. Okay, which is a very disturbing complaint. So the patient will be able to tell you clearly if he is having a nasal regurgitation. Then moving on to the next nerve which is the accessory nerve. Accessory nerve involvement we commonly say the patient will not be able the patient will say I am not able to move my head from side to side. This is commonly seen in patients with accessory nerve involvement or the patient is not able to say uh, yes, no, something he might not be able to shrug his shoulders. That this will be more evident during examination but when you ask the history you should also ask for these complaints if the patient is able to appreciate he will be able to come out with these complaints. Okay. The next nerve, the last one will be the hypoglossal nerve. The 12th cranial nerve is the hypoglossal nerve. Hypoglossal nerve supplies the tongue. So it can, uh, that tongue involvement can be either an upper motor neuron involvement or a lower motor neuron involvement. So in accordance with that the symptoms can also be present. So upper motor neuron involvement will be mostly that the patient will have a very stiff tongue. Whereas if there is a lower motor neuron involvement the tongue will be very flaccid. It will be a very flabby tongue and he will not, he will, he will have difficulty in controlling the movements of the tongue. There might also be some fasciculations. So the patient will say, I am not able to make a food bolus inside my mouth. I am not able to maneuver the food inside my mouth and make a bolus. Okay. And there, I feel that my tongue is deviated to one side, that my tongue is being pulled to one side and I also have difficulty in talking. So this difficulty in talking, as you can see, this can be because of either a glossopharyngeal involvement or a vagus nerve involvement which can involve the you know vocal cords. So that might be the reason why he is not able to talk or it can be because of the hypoglossal nerve involvement or it can be a central uh, lesion like he, it's a vascular lesion which can produce aphasia or it can be a facial nerve involvement uh, causing you know, a deviation of the mouth which in turn causes a, a difficulty in talking. All these things can produce a difficulty in speech and talking. So once we complete this we should be able to say once we complete the entire history taking we should be able to say if the patient is having this difficulty in talking because of which complaint, which involvement, where, wherever is the lesion accordingly the uh, complaint will be produced. So we need to be able to differentiate all these specific things.